A few more seconds. All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. For those of you who are joining Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for the first time, we are all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live uh, into classrooms uh, around the world. Um, during these challenging times, we are now broadcasting live into the homes of parents, educators, and students everywhere. So it's so great uh, to be able to keep the learning going uh, in this way. So we're really excited for today's event. In fact, this week is Environment Week. And so to celebrate, we've teamed up with Environment and Climate Change Canada to host a series of events this week. So this is our first one this week. We have another one coming up tomorrow and then again on Friday. And I'll talk a little bit more about those two events uh, as we wrap up for today. But we are really excited to be spending a little time with Elizabeth Gallerno today. She is a research scientist with the Air Quality Research Division of Environment and Climate Change Canada. And her work focuses on air pollutants that can cause cancer or other serious health effects. So today she's going to highlight some of the tools scientists and technicians use to understand where the pollution is coming from and then of course what we can do uh, to mitigate it. So Elizabeth it's so great to have you joining us live today. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better uh, and then we're going to have lots of questions. I see lots tuning in on YouTube uh, and we have a great group joining us on camera as well. Fantastic. Thanks very much Joe. I'm just going to launch right into uh, my presentation start by sharing my screen and that looks like all the settings are correct so um, are you able to see a title slide uh, just putting putting it into screen there we go that looks good Okay, excellent. All right, so I am going to talk about a few of the mysteries that are associated with air pollution. And I work as a research scientist in the Air Quality Research Division at Environment and Climate Change Canada. So that's the department of the federal government in Canada that deals with all issues relating to the environment and climate change. We have a specific division that looks at air pollution issues, and that's the Air Quality Research Division where I work. It takes a lot of different people working together to be able to do air pollution research. It's always a team effort, no matter what type of project we're working on. And this is a picture that was taken recently um, with me and Adriana, who's actually on the line, who's another scientist working with me, and Raj as well, who's one of the technicians in our group. And he had actually built and designed the little sample um, sampler container that we're seeing that we're both leaning on, that dark black tube. So there are scientists who are doing the scientific work of trying to understand what's going on with air pollution. And we also have technicians who take care of all of the instrumentation and setting us up to be able to take the measurements that we want to take. And these measurements were being taken right at near the spot of the world's busiest highway, which is Highway 401 here in Toronto near Pearson Airport. And you can see all the traffic behind us in the picture of us. Uh, and a lot of vehicles uh, going by every day. And we were trying to take measurements to better understand the pollution that's coming off that highway. But air pollution is measured in all different kinds of ways and different places as well. So in Toronto, again, you can see on the left, uh, this is my colleague, Tom, who's done some measurements at different uh, heights along the CN Tower to understand how pollutants change in the vertical scale. Because Canada is a circumpolar nation, we have an Arctic um, geography to much of the country, we do a lot of uh, research up in the Arctic. And you can see Haley here, uh, who is getting around by Skidoo, she's a research scientist who looks at a lot of contaminants in the Arctic. There have been some uh, studies where a ship has been locked into the ice and the ship will get frozen in for a season and scientists and technicians are on board to do uh, research and experiments there. And sometimes they leave the ship and go uh, to nearby ice to do some of their measurements as well. We also get around by helicopter in the Arctic and we can see Andrew S here, who's the chief technician in our group uh, who is setting up some measurements. Sandy and Jeff were here, often doing work in the Arctic. If we're out on the ice, there can sometimes need to be protection from animals like polar bears. And here, Sandy and Jeff were hoping that they could use their Nerf guns to offer them some protection. 
We also take measurements from aircraft. You can see a research aircraft here and Roman, one of our technicians who's actually inside the aircraft, which you can see is full of instrumentation that's used to look at air pollution in different ways. And we also have a mobile laboratory called Cruiser down here at the bottom. And we can see Raj and another Andrew, Andrew E, who are doing some of the work on that vehicle. And just to the right here, you look for, it's a view from the back of the vehicle to show you just all the instrumentation that is in this truck that we can drive around. Finally, in the middle, uh, we have um, a few people who are releasing what's called an ozone sonde. So this is Mohammed here in the beige pants, and he uh, used to work with me, and he is in the process here of setting off an ozone sonde, which is this big white balloon. Inside that balloon is a bunch of different instrumentation for measuring temperature and pressure and so on. And once that balloon is released, it rises up in the air and it's able to take measurements as it goes up to um, give information back to us about what's going on as you go up in the atmosphere. Down here is Jeremy who was doing some work in the oil sands as part of a big study there. So we have ground-based measurement sites as well. You can see the scaffolding for some platforms where we put, would put different instruments there. So you can see that even though we're all looking at air pollution, there are different ways, different instruments, different locations that we examine in the course of our work. And traveling is one of the really fun parts of the job if you're an air pollution researcher. And a few years ago, I had the chance to go to Taiwan. The second largest city in Taiwan is called Kaohsiung and I got to go there for a conference. And I stayed at this really neat hotel, which is basically uh, has, it looks almost like a transformer with no arms on it. And the hotel part was up at the top and from uh, the window near my elevator one day, I took a picture just to, to have a memory of what the surrounding area looked like. Then a couple of days later, I looked through the same window and I saw something very different. I saw what was a smog pollution episode. And so this leads us to the first mystery that we're gonna look at in the presentation today. And the mystery is what makes the air look hazy sometimes? And a little hint is that you can actually make this kind of air pollution yourself in a jar. And I'll show you with a little video that I made with my assistant earlier today. Here I am with B, who's my assistant for making air pollution in a jar. We're using this little glass jar because it's see-through and also because it won't burn or melt. And the reason that those things are important is that we're using matches to uh, make the air pollution. So if you want to try this at home, make sure you have a grown-up with you because we're dealing with fire. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to light a couple of matches and put them in the jar. And then Dee's going to hold the jar up close to the camera and now give it a little shake. And look what happens. You can see all kinds of little combustion particles coming off the matches. And those are the same kinds of combustion particles that come out of tailpipes from vehicles and different kinds of smokestacks as well. And they can build up in that jar because there isn't much air circulation, right? Those little particles were stuck in the jar. And that's what happens on smog days. There tends to not be very much wind on those days. And so the pollutants that come out of our tailpipes and smokestacks and so on get sort of stuck. There's no wind to move them around. So by doing that demo and showing you in that jar, we solved that first mystery, that hazy, cloudy look to the air when we're having an air pollution episode or a smog episode is actually caused by air pollution particles. <clears throat> well, and what happens often in science is as soon as you solve one mystery, you have another one that pops up. And that leads us right into the second mystery that we're gonna take a look at, which is what size are those air pollution particles? And it turns out that they are very, very small. Now, most of you have probably seen a ruler before and you know how big a centimeter is. And then there's a little tiny division within the centimeters, there are 10 millimeters. So imagine that tiny millimeter. Well, those combustion particles that we just looked at when we did our match experiment or the combustion particles that will come out of vehicles are so small that you can stack hundreds of them in a line before you reach that one millimeter mark. So that gives you an idea of just how small they are. There are other airborne particles that are quite a bit bigger. And in areas of the world, like in Beijing and China, they're susceptible to sandstorms from the nearby Gobi Desert. 
And so the sand particles that can fill the air during storms like that are quite a bit bigger, but you can still fit more than 10 of them across to get to a millimeter. So big or small, these in terms of how big they are relative to a millimeter, they're still pretty small in general. And that makes them able to travel pretty long distances, as you can see in this video. Lisa's intrigued by an instant message from a friend. He said there will be a lot of air pollution in the city over the next few days. And yet, this morning, when she was walking her dog, it was windy. Wouldn't the wind blow air pollutants away? She checks weather.gc.ca, sees a smog warning, and immediately understands. The smoke particles come from forest fires burning thousands of kilometers away. The wind will carry the particles all the way to her city. A few drops of rain? Nothing better to wash the particles out of the air. So we saw with that video that particles and other pollutants can travel very long distances. And that especially happens when they're called persistent, so they don't break down easily in the environment. And the last line on that video said that rain can help wash them out of the air. Well, it turns out that the same thing is true for snow. Snowflakes and raindrops can actually act like brooms, so they can clean those particles out of the air when they fall. And it's hard to get photographs of raindrops capturing particles, but somebody has managed to take pictures of snowflakes. And these are snowflakes that actually fell through the air. And if you look very closely to where you see the arrows pointing, you can see tiny, tiny combustion particles that have been swept out of the air by these snowflakes. So rain and snow actually help to clean the air. They're one of the removal processes. So emission processes put the particles into the air, removal processes take them out of the air. Particle size is really important when it comes to how these particles interact with our bodies. The smaller the particles are, the more deeply they can go into our respiratory systems. So the larger particles will be trapped more in our nose and mouth, but as the particles get smaller and smaller, they can get more and more deeply embedded into our lungs. And what has become understood only in recent years is that some particles are so small that they can actually go directly into our brains. It was previously thought that something called the blood brain barrier would keep those particles outside of our brains. But we now know that some of the particles that are emitted because of pollution are so small that through our noses or through our spinal column, they can make it directly into our brains. So in terms of the mystery about how um, small particles are, or what size they are, it turns out they're very small. And because of that, they can travel long distances if they aren't removed from the air by snow or rain or other removal processes. And when we breathe, they can get into our lungs, our blood, and even our brains. So we've talked a lot about particles, but another mystery is what about pollutants that aren't in particles? Sometimes we're aware of pollution that isn't particulate. Um, if we're at a gas station, we smell that gasoline smell, and that uh, is caused by pollutants that are called VOCs. On the right, there's a picture of a sewer, and I actually, when I was in engineering school, I spent a summer inspecting sewers, and uh, there are sewer gases, which are pollutants, some of which just don't smell good and they're a nuisance, but other ones are uh, also a health hazard and can be hazardous to our health. Then finally, on the bottom left, a lot of pesticides that we use in agriculture and for cosmetic purposes as well um, can off gas once they've been applied. So they do something called volatilizing or evaporating. And I can tell, I certainly walk around my neighborhood sometimes and I can smell when somebody has just applied pesticide to their lawn. So that's another kind of pollutant that's in, that's a gas phase or gaseous pollutant. And gas pollutants can travel long distances just like particles can. So this is a, a view of the globe in a way that maybe you're not used to seeing it. We're basically looking at it from above. So you can see the North Pole there and much of the space toward the bottom is the Pacific Ocean. And what Renata Bailey did in this study that was published in 2000, so 20 years ago, was to look at air measurements that were taken in Tagish, Yukon. So Tagish is about 100 kilometers away from Whitehorse, which is the capital of Yukon territory. 
And when concentrations of certain pesticides were detected, these were pesticides that were no longer used in Canada at the time, but they were still being used in China. And on instances that they were detected in Tagish, she was able to use computer modeling to look at where the air came from. And it turned out that on those days that those pesticides were detected, sure enough, the air was coming from areas where they were still used. We can use computer models in different ways. One way is to track uh, the way Renata did in that study. Another is through modeling that just shows us how pollutants move around and are distributed um, over smaller areas. So this is an area over the Great Lakes. This is work that I did with uh, Cindy, who's in this picture here. And Toronto is right here, so on uh, Lake Ontario. And this is a toxic pollutant called phenanthrene. So it's a kind of pollutant which is, belongs to a class of toxic pollutants called PAHs. And this will just show you how the pollutants move around over seven day cycle over a week. So the low colors, the low blue cool colors are the lowest concentrations of these pollutants in the air. And then as you move up the color scale to warmer colors through yellow and orange and red, you're getting to higher concentrations. So I'll just hit play and I'll show you, you can see how the wind direction changes over these seven days and blows the pollutants around and spreads them around from their sources. And this gives us an idea of where the pollutants go once they're emitted. These kinds of gas phase can pollutants can even act like grasshoppers. They don't just move around from one place to the other, maybe across the Pacific Ocean, but they can actually uh, move according to something called the grasshopper effect. They can be used in tropical regions, so near the equator, maybe as pesticides for tropical diseases. And then the way that the, uh, their properties work, they get evaporated uh, on during warm weather and they can make their way northward and then maybe night falls or a cooler weather system comes through and then they tend to deposit to the ground. But the next day or a new warm weather system will come out and they will re-evaporate and then move up again. And through these hops, these multiple hops that are called the grasshopper effect, they can end up accumulating in cold regions, in polar regions like the North Pole, and they can be found in areas where they were never used. So this has been identified as a real concern for, for pollutants that are persistent, that don't break down easily in the environment and aren't used anywhere near Canada. But because of the grasshopper effect, they've been able to accumulate in Northern Canadian territories. So the mystery we were looking to solve was about pollutants that aren't particles. Air pollutants can be particles or gases and both types can travel long distances if they're persistent. So the last mystery we're gonna look at is how can we protect ourselves? First thing we can do is we can create less pollution. So there's a table here showing a few different kinds of sources, motor vehicles. Instead, we can uh, walk or cycle or use our scooters or our skateboards, green transportation options that create less pollution. In terms of heating and, and creating electricity with fossil fuels, we can try when we can to use more energy efficient equipment or to improve our home insulation so that we don't have to use quite as much fuel. There are also consumer products like toys or cosmetics. We can choose to reduce our consumption of these goods or reuse them and recycle them or choose to buy eco-friendly products. So these are some questions that can be really useful to you, to you to ask in your household or in your classroom. What else can you do to help reduce air pollution in your home and your community? The second way that we can protect ourselves is to reduce our exposure. And we need information to do that. We need to know what the levels are and which times we should be reducing our exposure. And the Air Quality Health Index is one of the ways um, or information tools that can help us to do that. What are you breathing today? Know the quality of the air around you every day of the year, wherever you are. The Air Quality Health Index relates air quality on a simple color-coded scale from 1 to 10. The higher the number, the higher the risk. Risks from breathing pollutants include inflammation in your lungs, making it harder to breathe, and symptoms like a scratchy throat or coughing. 
Anyone can feel the effects from bad air if they are engaged in strenuous exercise, sports, or work outdoors when the AQHI values are high. Bad air is especially harmful for people with asthma, heart conditions, lung disease, or other respiratory problems. Look for the AQHI in your weather updates and check air quality online. The AQHI is designed to help you make decisions to protect yourself when there is poor air quality and choose the best times to be active. For more information, go to our website, airhealth.ca. A message from Health Canada and the Government of Canada. So if you live in Canada, you can check the AQHI value near you by going to this website that's written in blue at weather.gc.ca and looking up the air quality health index in your community. And if you find your community's name, you'll then find a value and a risk level that's associated with it. And you can interpret it according to the information in this chart. Depending on whether you're part of an at-risk population, if you have a heart problem or a breathing problem, you're considered to be at risk or if you're part of the general population. And depending on the uh, risk value that the AQHI indicated, you can decide if it's a good time to go outside, if it's a good time to exercise outside, or if maybe you should reschedule or avoid those activities for now. So the mystery of how we can protect ourselves really has two answers. One is by creating less pollution, and the second one is reducing our exposure to the pollution that is already out there. So that takes us to the end of some of the, the mysteries that I wanted to look at with you today. The first, what makes the air look hazy sometimes? Well, that's caused by air pollution particles. What size are those particles? Well, they're much smaller than the width of a human hair, so very, very small. What about pollutants that aren't in particles? Pollutants can be gases and they can do many of the same things that air pollution particles do in the environment. And then finally, how can we protect ourselves? Well, we can create less produce, produce pollution and we can reduce our exposure. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. All right. Great presentation, Elizabeth. Great summary uh, at the end as well. It's pretty amazing the way that, uh, you know, those pollutants can move around the planet and substances we may have banned here can still uh, be an issue and something we have to watch out for when they can drift uh, from other locations. So thanks for that great presentation and a great way that we can kind of keep an eye on what's going on around us with the air indexes. All right. So we've got a great group joining us on YouTube. So if you have questions for Elizabeth, the chat sidebar is on the right. If you can send your questions um, there, I will keep an eye out for them. And then we also have live camera groups with us. So I'm going to pick a few of those groups. Uh, to jump in and ask some of their questions as well. So why don't we get started? Let's see. We have Aurora and John joining us. Aurora and John are joining us from Toronto. Let's get that microphone turned on. No, can you guys pop it on for me? It's not coming on. There we go. Hey, Toronto, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, how are you? Thank you. How are you? Good stuff. How close are you to downtown? Are you pretty close or outside of downtown? We're outside. Of outside downtown. Of Very cool. All right. Yeah. Do you guys have a question for Elizabeth? Um, I don't think so. Do you, John? I Anything don't. you're curious about? Um, not really. Okay, I, can come I think back. it was pretty clear. For That's okay. I can come back to the two of you. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go now. We've got a group of students who are joining us from Emeryville, Ontario. Looks like they're grade eight students and their teacher, uh, Miss Massey, is joining us in the call. Let me turn their microphone on. There Hello. we go. Hi. Uh, it's good. Uh, we had some of the students were able to get on, but unfortunately, some of the students could not access the um, YouTube link. It kept asking them for their G Suite account, and they do have the G Suite account, but it would not let them log on for some reason. Is there a way to uh, fix that as other members are going on to other 
events. And also, uh, will there be a recording available of this as the students who did not get on um, would really like to be able to uh, access the recording? Okay, so um, I can't help with the G Suite thing. That sounds more like a school board thing, but if it's asking them for their password uh, to get on. Um, no, they're signed into their accounts, but when they come up to YouTube, um, they sent a screenshot and it says to access this, you must be signed into a G Suite account, which, which they were signed into their G Suite account. So they're not sure um, what that glitch might be. Yeah. Um, we don't usually encounter that. I think it might have something to do with being signed in via a school board sign in. So the only thing I could suggest mm -hmm. is if they came to YouTube via personal computer without uh, signing in and then that would bypass um, something like that and absolutely record all the events. So this event, when it wraps up today, will be live and available for anybody uh, to take advantage of today. Okay, and will that be at the uh, same YouTube address or will that be at a different link? Um, no, it'll be the same. It'll, it'll come up as the, the latest video. Mm, okay, and I'll contact our uh, tech person at the board to uh, ask them about that too, to see what's going on on our end. Perfect. Um, for the ones that did get in, did any questions come in yet? Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, uh, we are in Windsor, uh, Essex County, so we do have a lot of uh, issues with air pollution. And they're just wondering um, what Elizabeth's thoughts are on the fact that air pollution seems to be going down with the COVID uh, crisis that we are facing. And they're wondering, um, what has she noticed about that and how much has it gone down? So I have certainly noticed it where I live in Toronto. Um, although this isn't traditionally a very high pollution time of year. Um, and certainly there have been reports from all over the world where measurements have come out already showing that levels of pollutants have gone down and some pretty dramatic pictures that I remember seeing from India uh, with visibility improving quite a bit because of the, the particles in the air, uh, the levels of them going down. Unfortunately, I don't have any quantitative information to give you about local pollution decreases. I don't, I haven't seen any numbers come out. I know that we are taking measurements um, and that I'm assuming that, that those uh, data are being analyzed right now. They just, they, I guess they're not far along enough in the analysis yet to have put the numbers out. Um, but it sounds to me like you're just observing uh, the air from where you are, you're seeing some decreases since since traffic and so on has been reduced through the COVID crisis. Is that correct? Whoops, um, you're it, sorry. It, that's okay. Uh, I think it's that and a couple of the students mentioned also a decrease in um, air traffic, which is causing a decrease in pollution. And uh, so if these measures are being noticed globally, because um, one student also saw that there's a uh, the smog is cleared in China and they did look before at wearing uh, face masks in China and Poland as part of school supplies because of the air quality there, uh, specifically in Krakow, Poland. So if that's the case, um, do you think researchers and the government will be looking into um, <clears throat> you know, measures to be able to improve air quality with what, air quality with what we've learned during this COVID time? I think for sure this is something that we, we call a natural experiment or an unexpected experiment where I can't imagine that there would have been somebody, you know, two years ago planning an experiment and say, let's just cut all the traffic and the industrial activity and see, see what will happen. That, that it just wouldn't have been feasible. But now that it's happened in a way that's outside of our control, there are definitely lessons to be learned from this. And unfortunately, it can be a little bit slow to analyze data and to really make sure that you're drawing the right kinds of conclusions, that you have enough data uh, to be able to draw conclusions. But I have every confidence that, that every scientist who is able to look at those data is going to be trying to use them and, and to ensure that, they're, that the new information is used to protect um, you know, and minimize exposure, especially for vulnerable populations like children. Yeah, and I think, you know, you touched on it. It's, it's important to remember, too, that, you know, we're seeing this change, but it was a forced change. So if things kind of return back to normal, we're going to quickly see 
um, you know, the levels that we're used to. So there definitely needs to be different policies and different, uh, different regulations put in place if we do want to see continued improvements. Because you're right, this is a huge experiment right now that nobody was expecting. So there's going to be some good data coming from it. But um, we have to decide what to do when the experiment does end, which it will uh, inevitably end. Absolutely. And, and there are two steps to it. We may observe differences in the in visibility and so on in, in our perception of the air quality, but then being able to attach actual changes in health outcomes is another part of the analysis. So has asthma incidence reduced or have other health outcomes reduced? It may not be an obvious relationship between what we've observed in the air and what is actually being seen in, in health outcomes. So that's another part of the analysis that has to be done before any decisions can be made about further actions. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a question that came in on YouTube. This is from Graydon and Graydon's curious, um about long-term health effects that have been uh, have been found for people who regularly run or cycle in urban cores, like say downtown Toronto or other um, really developed areas. So people are always interested in these questions. And when we give talks as air pollution scientists, we get these questions, but unfortunately I'm not a health scientist. So I have very little background, unfortunately, to comment about um, long-term health effects in particular, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the air quality health index and what we can do to sort of get the information we need to protect ourselves, um, in our everyday actions. But unfortunately, I just, I don't have the expertise to be able to speak to that. I'm so sorry. That's okay. But it'd be fair to say that a good thing to do would be to keep an eye, um, on those indexes before you do decide maybe for something really strenuous, uh, Absolutely. And I've also seen in some Canadian cities, I believe it's Montreal, I'm not 100% sure, but there are route planners that you can use to plan your bicycle route or your walking route so that you will go through um, areas and streets that are less polluted than others. So that can help you reduce your exposure as well. All right. Uh, let's see here. I've got another mic to turn on. This time we're going to go to British Columbia. Um, we've got Annabelle hanging out with us. Let me get that microphone. Oh, it's Victoria. There we go. Hey, Victoria, how are you? Oh, Vic Victoria, it says your mic is on, but I can't hear you. Can you hear me? There we yeah. go. We got you now. Um, what is sort of a typical day for you, Elizabeth, as a research scientist? Um, a typical day for me is uh, spending actually a lot of time in my office. So the type of research I tend to do is quite heavy on data analysis and on computer modeling. So I spend a lot of time at my desk uh, at a computer uh, doing, doing data analysis and writing uh, reports, writing scientific papers and so on. But part of my work also involves uh, supervising and being involved in laboratory experiments and measurements that are being done out at different outdoor locations as well. So um, that, that time that I'm spending in my, at my desk also gets uh, interspersed with visits to the laboratory and talking to the people on my team uh, to get updates about how their experiments are going, challenges that they might be facing and doing some troubleshooting around that. Okay. And then the, the data you have access to, um, you know, to be able to see how things are moving around on any given day, is that pretty, pretty much real time? It would depend on the pollutant that you're looking at. So the, the, our ability to forecast for certain pollutants like particulate matter and ozone, we're, we're getting pretty close to using the term now casting because it's, it's uh, um, available in, in near real time. Uh, but for the pollutants that I study, these toxic pollutants, the, just the scientific foundation and knowledge about them is a bit less advanced than it is for some other pollutants. So the, the computer modeling and the measurements that we do uh, are quite intensive. And so we don't have that, that real-time capability yet, although we're, we're always striving to get that. Not, just not there yet. All right. Let's turn on another microphone here. We've got... Um... There it is. Mustada family joining us in Ajax, Ontario. Let's turn that mic on. Oh, 
Hey, John, I think you're gonna have to do it for me on your end. There we go. Okay, so um, I don't have any questions for Elizabeth. You have a question? I said I don't. No, we don't have any questions. We just want to say that it was a great <laughs> presentation for the kids to understand about air pollution. Okay. Tudor here with me, he said that he understood everything. So fantastic. Yeah. Do you have Tudor, any maybe. No, Tudor, have any Elizabeth is asking something. Well, I'm just saying maybe if you understood it, maybe you'll take after your mother and then you'll, you'll become an air pollution scientist too when maybe. you're big. Maybe. maybe that would be great. <laughs> and be as well, huh? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, That's Adriana. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Tudor. All right. Very cool. Um, I do want to echo that because I think you did a really great job of breaking down something that's complex and making it very uh, understandable for uh, the audience today. So solid science communication action going on here. Uh, thank you. Elizabeth, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. We've got Danny and Joshua joining us. Let me see if I can turn their mic on or they might have to do it on their end for us. Uh, Danny or Joshua, if you can hear me. There we go. How are hey, you guys Joe. doing today? Good, and you? Good, and I think you're joining us from Quebec. Yes, Val de Mont Quebec. Hi, Isabelle. How are you? Hi, Danny. I'm well. How are you? A great presentation. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Josh, do you have any question? A little boy is watching downstairs. Clearly, he has no question. No questions. <laughs> but can, me, I have a question for you, Elizabeth. Oh. What, what simple action we can take to, to help reduce hair pollution? Well, I think that everybody needs to look into that for themselves in terms of what's feasible for them. So I know for me, uh, the things that I find most straightforward to do are to really examine how often I use my car and if I might be able to walk or take transit or ride my bike somewhere instead of driving. And that way I'm able to reduce my, my vehicle pollutions quite readily. But I live in a very old house and it could probably use some work in terms of energy efficiency. And that's something that I haven't done yet that is sort of next, next on my list of things to do. And just because of the way my finances and my household work, you know, some, some actions are just easier to take than others or more affordable to take than others. Not every family is in the same situation. Uh, but for certainly for me, those are, those are the two big ones. And definitely in terms of consumer products, I just, I try to reduce and reuse and recycle uh, as much as possible. And I think COVID has also shown us how little consumption we can actually get away with, at, certainly over a short time. I mean, I think that it's a bit artificial because as time goes on, people's clothes and so on are gonna wear out and need replacement and so on. But it certainly has been commented to me by many people how little purchasing they've actually realized that they need to do. And the less purchasing that we do, certainly for products that have a very big ecological footprint, um, you know, that, that can also have an effect on the air pollutants that we generate. All right. So Susan sent in a question via YouTube and Susan is curious about the pollutants that uh, worry you the most. So are there a couple that you really keep an eye out for? Um, I, I would say I sort of switch the question a little bit because I, I'm not, again, I don't have the health expertise to be able to rank which ones are the most severe. I think this finding about these very tiny particles that are able to get directly to our brains, I find that, you know, not as a health scientist, but as, as a member of the public, I find that concerning. Uh, those tiny particles are combustion particles. We know that they contain toxic metals. Um, and there are starting to be some concerning links drawn between uh, the exposure to those particles and medical conditions that weren't typically associated with air pollution before, like dementia. Um, so I, I find that to be a really exciting uh, area of research, but, but one, especially as somebody who had a grandparent who, who had Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, talk of dementia and that there might be this preventable component uh, you know, once we develop the state of knowledge a little bit better, I find that exciting and, and concerning at the same time. 
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the same when you showed us that grasshopper effect of how the pollutants can kind of move uh, at different times and then are accumulating in those colder areas, like the Arctic, areas we think of as pristine, but are actually kind of becoming large sinks for these pollution, pollutants from uh, around the world. And, you know, I even read the other day about microplastics that uh, are being found in the Arctic that can drift in the air. So these beautiful pristine areas uh, are being impacted in ways that we never thought about maybe five, 10 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. So air pollution is certainly a problem that isn't solved yet. Um, you know, we've made great advances in terms of some pollutants, but there are definitely new issues that are being identified that are that definitely keeping air pollution scientists busy uh, to try to figure out what's going on and, and how we can reduce these, these emissions and these risks that are associated with them. Absolutely. So I think we can squeeze one more question in uh, for today. Um, so if someone wants to give me a wave of the camera, if there's another question from Ms. Massey's group or our group in BC, if they have another question, uh, I can check YouTube as well. No pressure. Uh, here we go. We've got um, to our group in Toronto, Aurora and John, who didn't have a question before. Do you guys want to turn your, your mic on or do you want me to just ask the question? I see that you typed it in. There they are. All right, go for it. Oh, no, we lost them again. <laughs> All right, you just need to unmute for me. Uh, there there we go. go. Okay, so does the air pollution shorten a human's life? So uh, you were breaking out a bit, but I think, did you ask if air pollution can shorten a human's life? Uh, the answer yeah. is absolutely yes. Absolutely. There's very solid evidence showing that premature, what we call premature mortality. So that's dying earlier than you would otherwise be expected to die. That is very much linked to exposure to air pollutants, particularly the ones that are used to forecast the AQHI. So that tool that looking up that AQHI value and deciding what you're going to do that day, if you're gonna go outside and really exercise hard um, or spend a lot of time outdoors, the pollutants that are part of that forecast are absolutely uh, associated with uh, reducing people's lifespans. Yeah. Um, so one more future question for you, Elizabeth. Uh, maybe something's coming down the pipe that you've heard about, or you think this might be possible in the future, but it seems like, you know, more and more every day, we can do more and more with our phones. Do you think the technology will get uh, portable enough that we can take accurate uh, air quality measurements with our phones, almost like citizen science? Absolutely. I have no doubt that that will be possible. There uh, have made great strides in miniaturizing uh, the instrumentation that is needed to take air quality measurements. So yeah, I have no, I, no difficulty envisioning that, that we could all be walking around with little sensors on us telling us uh, even from one block to the next, maybe that, you know, you link it up with GPS and it'll tell you, oh, don't turn right, turn left instead if you want a cleaner air for the rest of your walk. All right. Well, it'll definitely give us a real time picture of what's going on around the planet. That's for sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, Elizabeth, I want to give you a huge uh, shout out for joining us today and kicking off our Environment Week events with Environment and Climate Change Canada. So tomorrow uh, you can join us with um, Philippe Thomas, we're going to talk about uh, environmental contaminants in Indigenous communities and programs that they use to monitor those. And that's at 10 a.m. Eastern. And then on Friday, you can join us uh, with Gregory. And Gregory is going to tell us about monarch butterflies and their migrations and how he tracks them. So that's at 10 a.m. Eastern on Friday as well. So lots of great events coming up for Environment Week. A shout out to everybody on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in and sending us in some questions. Thanks to everybody who joined us live in the call today. And again, Elizabeth, thank you for breaking things down for us and uh, solving those mysteries for us today. Thanks very much to all of you for tuning in. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. We're going to sign off for today.